Welcome to episode number 14 of the First Responder Wellness Podcast, the show where we talk about wellness, mental health, leadership, and what it takes to have a wellness culture within your organization. My name is Conrad Weaver. I'm a filmmaker, podcast host, and the director of the award-winning film PTSD 911. For the past four years, I've been working with first responders from all across the USA to bring wellness to the forefront of our conversations. Today, I'm talking with Jason Harney. Jason is a retired sergeant with the Las Vegas Metro Police Department, and he's a Gulf War veteran, and he's an accomplished documentary filmmaker. Stay tuned for my conversation with Jason and for an important announcement we'll talk about in the last part of this podcast. Hey, I really appreciate you listening to the show. And if you think others would too, please subscribe and share. That helps us get the word out and helps other people to find this important podcast. I also want you to know that you can now access these interviews on our YouTube channel for free. Visit YouTube and search PTSD 911 movie to access the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the show, please send me an email and tell me about your company or organization. If you're looking to spread the word about what you do in the first responder space, this show may be a great fit for you. I would love to talk with you about how we can help. Thanks again for listening. And now here's my interview with Jason Harney. Well, Jason, welcome to the First Responder Wellness Podcast. It's good to see you and and thanks for coming on the show today. Yeah, it's great to see you as well, Conrad, again. And uh, I'm, you know, it's an honor to be on your show. Yeah, thanks for coming out to our screening event in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago. I appreciate that and appreciate you uh, coming out and supporting the the event there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you know, that's the second time I've uh, had the opportunity to view your film. And, uh, you know, for those that have yet to see it or had the opportunity to see it, I, I really, I couldn't recommend it more. You, you really uh, covered all of the aspects of, of what a first responder, you know, goes through on a daily basis and more importantly, how it affects them mentally. And, uh, I really loved what you did with the stories and, and, you know, the all encompassing aspect of covering fire, EMS, police, dispatch, et cetera, and, and really getting that, that family of first responders together. Yeah, it was uh, it was such an important project, and still continues to be. And we're just you know continuing to roll rolling it out across the country. We'll be in New York City for our New York premiere in uh, a couple of weeks, uh, December seventh. So it'll be kind of uh, probably after this. Actually, yeah, probably before this. Uh, no, it'll be after this thing comes out. So this this podcast will drop sometime mid December ish. So. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, we're just going around the country showing the film and excited to uh, get it in the hands of the people who need to see it. So that's the important thing. That's kind of what we want to why I wanted to bring you on the show today because you worked on uh, you know several projects. So in order for the audience to kind of get understand who you are, to give us the cliff notes of who you are and and your background. Well, my background uh, in terms of career was I was a I'm a retired police sergeant from uh, the Las Vegas Metro Police Department. Uh, I did 23 and a half years. And after retirement, it's actually this December, uh, eight years. I mean, the, the career gets more into the rearview mirror by the day. <laughs> but as, as you know, uh, I'm, I'm a fellow filmmaker like yourself mm-hmm. and uh, have, have done a number of documentary films, actually six to be exact, uh, mm-hmm. along with a docu-series. And, uh, you know, it's my passion and, and uh, I'm here to tell stories and, and tell important stories, particularly the ones that cover the critical issues for law enforcement that we believe the mainstream media tends to ignore. And, and that's that's what we do now. Yeah. Well, congratulations on all your work. And, and uh, I know you guys just released a, a film just a few weeks ago or in the process of doing that. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. The latest one, um, it's called, is there something going on at home? Uh, the, it is a film, a documentary film about the police family. Uh, oftentimes what ends up happening, of course, is we focus on the first responder, the police officer themselves. We forget about the spouses, the children, the significant others. And this film is intended to give a voice to, to those families that also need help. Because as we know, when a first responder, 
uh, incurs some level of trauma on the job, they're going to bring it right home with them, which means their family is going to suffer right along with them. So, um, yeah, the film has just been completed. We just released a trailer for it uh, a couple days ago and, and have gotten a really good reception on the on the trailer and, and some of that footage. And we're looking at a streaming platform release more than likely in December. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, so this, that theme of something going on at home, is that, is that something that you kind of went through yourself on your own journey? Is that kind of comes out of your personal experience and, and saw the need for that? Well, I can tell you that the uh, last 13 years of my career, I was a police sergeant. So you're a first line supervisor and you have a squad of, of anywhere from say 12 to, to 15 people under you each day. Mm -hmm. And let's just say that you have uh, one, one of the people that is on your squad and they're a high level performer. They're, they're doing everything that's expected of them. Uh, they're, they're an excellent employee, no issues. But then suddenly you noticed a dip in that performance and you, and you notice that they're just simply not acting like they normally do. They might have become more isolated. They're not as talkative and certainly they're not doing their job at the level that they did or that you'd been accustomed to see them doing. So as a first line supervisor, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to bring them into a room privately. You're going to sit them down to talk about that performance. And the first question is always going to be, is there something going on at home? Why? Because typically that is what causes these dips in performance, because, you know, as you know, uh, from, from your own film and research that, you know, first responders, when uh, they incur the stress that occurs on the job, some of the trauma and, and just the day to day. When that starts to go home, it can cause marital problems. There can be issues with the schedule. There could be issues with the kids and the brunt going on, maybe the significant other at home while the uh, other person is at home working. Uh, I'm sorry, is at, at work, you know, working these crazy shifts and doing all these different things. So that's really where the idea for, for the title of the film came from. Now, as far as through the experience, you know, we are telling the stories to in particular of uh, two families, uh, one of which all of the issues began after the police officer retired. And then the other one is somebody who had to leave law enforcement mid-career because of the family problems that it was causing at home, particularly with uh, raising their children. Mm -hmm. So it's two very interesting stories that I think everybody will be able to relate to one way or another. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing the film and and, you know, when it comes out, I look forward to that. And uh, uh, but I really brought you here today to talk about a previous film that you worked on and something that we're going to announce at the end of this podcast of, of some collaboration between the two of us. So tell us about mm -hmm. that film. What is it and why is it important? Wristlock, the martial arts influence on police use of force. We uh, released it in September of 2023. Why is it important? It, it is a film that addresses the deficiencies in police training, particularly as it relates to police use of force, an issue, as we know, that is as hot button uh, in this country as it ever has been. And, and that's never going to change in, in today's day of body cam and dash cam type video that we all have access to. The media is famous for playing a few seconds of that and then letting the public you know, basically draw their conclusions as to what happened. Yeah. So, you know, uh, this film delves into that. A lot of my career was spent as a police trainer, as a defensive tactics instructor. Uh, I had the opportunity to be a training counseling officer in our police academy for three years. And then I went back a few years later as the sergeant and ran the police academy for three years. So it was a passion of mine, police training, generally speaking. Uh, so the film, we traveled across the country and, and spoke with people that kind of met this criteria. They were a martial artist, since we know that all police defensive tactics training is derived from the martial arts. They were police trainers and retired cops who had the same dedication to police training that myself and the film's main subject, John Gentile, did. Um, and you know, lo and behold, we all have the fr same frustrations is what we found out by talking to all of these people as far away from our hometown of Las Vegas as Jacksonville, Florida. We went, uh, all over the country and met with some very legendary people in the field, such as Tony Blauer, Eric Paulson, UFC hall of famer, Forrest Griffin, Betsy Brantner Smith, 
the list goes on. And, and they all generally said the same thing. In order to have a successful outcome in a police use of force situation, a police officer needs to be proficient in defensive tactics, they must be physically fit, and their mental health during their career must be kept in check. If any one of those factors is missing, then you're likely going to have an unsuccessful outcome that could lead to a lot of the things that the public tends to get angry about mm -hmm. when they see those things on video. Of course, they're still not getting the whole story. And that's what we try to provide in this film. Mm -hmm. You know, so, it's, so many times I'm scrolling through Facebook or Instagram or even YouTube, you see these short clips of, of officers involved in tussles and struggles. And there, there are times when I'm, I'm wondering, okay, and I know, knew about your film and it's like, okay, obviously this officer doesn't know jujitsu or doesn't know this other forms of, you know, of, of martial arts, because if they would, that wouldn't be a problem. What's going on there? You know, uh, obviously to your point, I haven't seen the whole story beginning, you know, of how this developed. Uh, but it seems like if officers would be better trained to handle, to know how to, if there, are well, just what was, for example, there was a, a video that surfaced just yesterday of an officer in New York city walking his beat. I think it was a, a, a man walking his beat and this guy came up from, from behind him and tried to take his weapon. And it was a long struggle before he got him finally down to the ground. I'm like, if this officer would have had some of these tactical trainings that you guys propose in your film, that would have probably been a quick, a, a quick deal, you know? So is that a problem with officers not understanding how to do these things or not being trained properly? Uh, that hits the nail on the head, Conrad. It's not being trained properly or in some cases not being trained at all. There's about 18,000 police departments in this country mm -hmm. comprised by about 900,000 police officers. And uh, the majority, I'd say about 80% of those police departments have 50 officers or fewer. They simply do not have the in-place infrastructure to have a proper training regimen for their cops throughout their careers. So here's what happens. They go to a police academy and they get that foundational base knowledge in defensive tactics and use of force procedure and policy. But then most departments and the, the states that oversee training do not require any training beyond that police academy, which they means they could go five years, 10 years, 15 years, and never actually be retrained and practice things such as baton, handcuffing, self-defense, empty hand tactics, team arrest, the list goes on and on. So it's like a one and done, it's like a one and done training? In, in most agencies, yes. You have what's called Peace Officer Standards and Training or POST for the acronym. Every state has one, and they're supposed to oversee training requirements for police departments. And unfortunately, defensive tactics is at the bottom of the list. Mm. You know, as, as some people will talk about, you'd see talk about in my film, Betsy Bratner Smith in, in, in particular brings up the fact that they're more into political sensitivity training and, and you know, talking about people's proper pronouns or talking about uh, diversity and all these hot button issues that they think are more important. I'm not saying those are not important things to talk about because they are actual issues in our society. However, to let go something that you could potentially have to utilize every single shift in a critical incident certainly makes no sense to any police trainer. But you'll talk to chiefs, sheriffs, administrators of police departments, and unfortunately, time is of the essence. There are calls that are holding. And so that's always going to be the priority. I mean, we have a, a manpower crisis in this country when it comes right. to police, as we know. And the priority is always going to be to get those cops on the street to answer calls. Training goes by the wayside, but yet let one of those cops screw up. And what's the first thing they do? They yeah. scrutinize, right? Yeah. So in my opinion, I feel like most of these departments are setting their cops up for failure. Hmm. And that then can lead to mental health crisis for an officer. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the stories in the film is, is a guy, uh, Alex Salazar. He's a, a former Los Angeles police officer. And, you know, what basically happened to him is he's involved in this off-duty incident. And then uh, it changed him. Uh, by his mm. own words, it made him a racist because he is a Hispanic officer he was attacked by another, uh, basically, Hispanic gang, 
And in that case, he started to become biased against anybody who uh, was a person of color. He saw Mm -hmm. them as an enemy. He saw violence as the first thing he saw. And he explains that in the film. But, you know, a a, a working theory, uh, at least of mine and a lot of other police trainers, is that when you your tactics are so low, your proficiency is so low and your physical fitness is so low. I feel like a lot of the police brutality cases that we see in this uh, country could be a result of that mental health issue Mm -hmm. being left unchecked. You know, I had said Mm -hmm. earlier that any one of those three things missing means the outcome becomes in question. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those cases, you'll see an officer either overreact or underreact because either their mental health is not in check or uh, their physical fitness, they don't have confidence in the ability to even last maybe 60 seconds in an actual suspect encounter, Mm -hmm. or they know that their proficiency level is so low that they'll probably lose the fight if they don't get the upper hand, even if it means using excessive force. Mm -hmm. So you can see it's a complex issue and that's what we try to tackle in the film. Yeah. You know, it, it kind of boggles my mind that, you know, we have, if, if you take the sports analogy, you have a sports team and they, they recruit the best of the best, right? Say it's a college team or even an NFL team. They, they recruit the best of the best. And then they pump in resources to keep that athlete at peak performance. Also, they can win, right? It, it, that's the bottom line. As long as they're winning, then they're doing the right thing. It, it boggles my mind that our, our first responder agencies don't provide the resources for peak performance for their people. I mean, here you are addressing the general public. You're interacting with the general public. And if you're not, I mean, we've all seen the, the, the jokes about donuts and cops, you know, that that's kind of a long time thing, you know, but there's some truth to that. As far as you see officers who are overweight, they're, they're not taking care of themselves. It's evident. Maybe it's a result of, you know, something going on at home or something that's, you know, some other kind of issue. But obviously, it's not a priority. And if that's not a priority, then to your point, we are going to see more of these things show up and see the YouTube videos and the things on the evening news because of things that were handled improperly. Because of, you know, if if, if you're going to have people interacting with the general public, they should be working at peak performance. And our agencies and our communities and our city leaders and our government leaders should be providing the resources to help them be at peak performance so that we can have healthy first responders. No question. And those are all really great points. And, and, and I mean, we've had this discussion before. Well, one, one of my favorite parts of PTSD 911, of course, was when you visited the facility in Texas that was doing exactly what you're talking about yep. in risk lock. Uh, we speak about this concept called the street athlete that was kind of coined by Betsy Brantner Smith's uh, husband, Dave Smith, who was known as Buck Savage in the 1980s as an Arizona DPS cop uh, doing training videos. And, you know, that that concept is basically what you're talking about to say that police officers deserve to be trained like professional athletes because of the mere fact that on any given time, any call, any, any interaction with the public could turn into that use of force incident. And you are charged already with performing at an optimal level. Mm -hmm. You have to, it's part of the profession. It's why we bring Forrest Griffin, you know, again, former UFC uh, champion and hall of famer into the film because little known fact, he was a police officer for four years. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we have him talk about what a mixed martial artist would, would endure when they sign a contract to fight, say, eight to 10 weeks from that point, well, they're mm-hmm. going to be in a training camp, right, where they're going to have a strength coach, a nutrition coach, a weight making coach, a striking coach, a head coach, all these people whose sole purpose is to ensure that you are in the best peak condition and and readiness to step in that cage and perform at a high level, right? Mm-hmm. Well, what does a cop get before they're in their next confrontation? <laughs> Like nothing. Okay. And we point, yeah. And they're sitting, in their, and they're sitting sure. in their car for maybe the last mm-hmm. two hours. Absolutely. And that, yeah. that's, a huge, that's a huge thing. So it just means you have to be even that much more prepared. Uh, and, and again, this goes back to what I said earlier, man. I, I think that a lot of uh, departments, unfortunately, are setting their cops up for failure. 
And you know, when you have that kind of training and experience and, and you're prepared, what it does to you mentally, you know, that mm-hmm. call comes in, you immediately begin processing that and what's going to happen and and you're ready you're you're more confident you're more you're you're more ready to face whatever it is you got to face because of that experience training yeah what, one of my favorite quotes from uh, the main subject in the film john gentile is he says uh, i'm i'm less likely to use force mm. knowing i can use force effectively mm. and that's a big statement it's very true it, it it lends to exactly what you just said and what you're talking about in that confidence is key and we talk about that in the film uh, many times over that, you know, that repetition and training that that, uh, you know, realistic type training where you basically are pressure testing yourself in an environment where, you know, there aren't any stakes where you can figure out what your strengths are, what your limitations are. You only learn that in training. But mm-hmm. I'm telling you, Conrad, the sad part is this training is not going on across the board in the profession. Sure, there are some police departments that, that do it correctly. I, I want to feel like the department I work for, Las Vegas Metro, uh, would get a gold star when it comes to what exactly what I'm talking about, even to this day. They have invested an enormous amount of, of time and money into ensuring that training is where it needs to be uh, in these areas. But most police departments, and I'm talking probably 85 to 90 percent of them, do nothing. Hmm. And, and I think that lends to a lot of the incidents that we see. And is that mostly just a budgetary issue or maybe it's a lack of even knowing about this kind of stuff that is, is a, can, can really benefit an agency? You know, it, it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. Yes, budget is absolutely one of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that a lot, of these, a lot of these agencies know, but one of the things we always talk about, I get asked the question, who is the target audience for this film, Risk Lock? And, mm-hmm. and people will assume it's cops. And I always say, no, it, it's not police officers. It's actually the mainstream public because I want them to have a resource to understand how a cop is trained and where the deficiencies are so that some of the questions they're asking about it are ultimately answered. But the problem is people say, well, this should be shown in every police academy. Well, here's why it won't be shown in any police academy, because after it's over, all the hands are going to go up in the class and they're going to ask the instructor who showed it, are we doing any of this? And the answer is going to be no, no. we're not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So what, what's a good first step for an agency? Well, uh, obviously, as you said, the information is out there and mm-hmm. it always has been. Uh, we, we started doing uh, this type of training that I'm referring to in the mid to late 1990s. And I see a lot of people who are now just embracing it. You had brought up jujitsu before. And one thing I want to convey on the whole martial arts side is – Keeping in mind, there are no uh, ground rules in in martial arts. So when you learn jujitsu, you're going to be taught things that your department policy for use of force almost assuredly will not allow Mm -hmm. you to use on the street. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that a department develops a defensive tactics program that is realistic and fits within policy and allows their officers to defend themselves in situations where deadly force is necessary with virtually any technique, meaning they're literally, they're in imminent jeopardy and their life is on the line or someone else's, or, you know, everything in between. You know, a cop is using force just by their mere presence. When they show up on a scene, they're wearing a uniform. They are an authority figure. That is using force. People obviously react to that. Some people just run when they see us, right? Mm -hmm. When you say something, you are using force. That's called a verbal command. So there's a lot of things that cops need to be trained on to escalate as necessary and de-escalate when necessary. But none of it matters if you don't have the confidence in your technique. And that mm. only comes from repetition. Mm. And so that, that practice, right? It, it's, mm-hmm. it's so important. Just, just as you practice in pulling your weapon and, you know, sighting in on target and hitting that target, you practice that over and over again. I mean, how many times did you practice, you know, firing your weapon when you were a cop? Well, my department uh, mandated you would qualify once per quarter. So every three okay. months, you'd have to go up to the range and you'd have to qualify with a minimum of 70% on that qualifications course. It would change four times a year. Nevada State Post, uh, here, here in you know, my home state, only requires a department to have their cops uh, qualify twice per year. 
So my department was doubling the standard. What happens with a lot of agencies is they're just going to do the minimum when it mm -hmm. comes to firearms training, defensive tactics training, any physical fitness training, of which there is none on any police agency, including the one I worked for. You go through a police academy and you take a physical fitness test to get into the academy, mm -hmm. to graduate the academy. But once you graduate, you never have to jump through that hoop again. So, yeah, it all depends on what is required by the state police officer uh, standards and training. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, back to what, you know, if you practice over and over again to fire your weapon, you become really good at that. Right. So when you practice these holds, these these moves to defend yourself, you know, in a safe way, you get you get good at that and that builds confidence. That's the whole idea, Conrad. That's exactly it. I mean, really think about it. Is, isn't that anything? I mean, I, I love having uh, filmmaking conversations with you because yep. we are basically saying the same thing. Yep. We might look at work we did five years ago and be like, wow, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> yeah. But the whole idea <laughs> is to get better, right? Yep. And, and to continue to learn. It's it's an evolving process. It's uh, Ray Bashirs who owns Blue Shield Tactical. He's one of the segments in Wrist Lock. And, and he talks about the fact that he kind of compares it to a vaccine, right? Where everyone thinks that it's one shot and done when really it's a continually continual training process. Meaning you can't just take what you learn in the academy and apply it for the next 25 years. You have mm -hmm. to evolve and get better through practice. And that is missing in the profession. Yeah. Something that, you know, to your point about filmmaking, I look at some of my early films and I'm like, crap, I need to fix that, you know, but it's, you know, 10, 12 years old and it's, it's not going to be fixed. So, but you learn, you, you evolve, you grow, you learn from your, yeah. I mean, even my podcasting, I've gotten better at, you know, over the years I've, you know, better at setting up the equipment and better at, you know, the, the questions I asked and, and the, you know, all the things that I do, because experience gives you that, that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's like that with anything. Um, the more you do it, the more you realize, even sometimes the more you realize you don't know what you don't know, you know, because the more you do it, you're like, Oh, you know what? Cause I've had conversations with filmmakers from across the, con the, the country. And I'm like, I didn't know that, you know, it's like, okay, I don't always know how much I don't know, you know? And so I'm always learning and always growing. And if, one has an open mind to learning and growing that I'm not the end all to this particular subject. Yeah, I can learn and I can get better. Yeah. And, and that's, that's an excellent comment. And, and I couldn't agree more. And, and it applies probably to everything in life when yeah. you think about it. But yeah, I mean, and, and that, that really is truly what's missing. You know, one of the best analogies that I can give you that, you know, certainly would apply to this is if, you know, you were about to say you have open uh, heart surgery and have your chest cracked open and, and, and have a surgeon going in there and, and doing a quadruple bypass. Um, obviously, that happened from a lot of uh, poor diet, no exercise. Mm -hmm. That's another issue covered in wrist lock, but that's mm -hmm. a completely another uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm making is what if that surgeon had had absolutely no retraining, no new techniques, no, uh, you know, further education since they had medical school 20 years prior. You want that guy opening up your chest? He's not touching oh, me, man. <laughs> obviously not. So we're expecting cops to literally do that every day. We're expecting them to suddenly just perform like they're superheroes and be able to take somebody into custody who's fighting for their own life, who, who, who's fighting, resisting, punching, kicking, biting, spitting, uh, take that person into custody and do so so that the public sees the video and thinks it looks pretty. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine being in that type of circumstance. And yet this is what we expect of our cops every single yeah. day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I can in a very small way relate. I used to work. I worked in a psychiatric hospital for three and a half years in an adolescent program. And we were trained in tact in ways of taking people down if they were combative. We were trained in ways of defense, you know, not, nothing like what you guys are trained at or what, what you prepare for. But I remember one day we had a kid who escaped, he ran off. And so I'm off, off chasing him. And we ended up on the middle of a four lane highway at rush hour in the morning. And one of the security guards from the hospital was out there with me. And here, here's two of us. And this kid is standing in the middle of the four lane traffic and he's now threatening to jump in front of a car. 
So we had to act. And I gave the security guard a signal. I went high. He went low. We took him down to the ground and he was basically in custody. You know, and by, by that time, an, an unmarked sheriff deputy pulled up and was like, you know, here we are. I'm in civilian clothes. The security guard has the hospital uniform security thing. But he's like, he's seen these two adult guys beating up on this kid. You know, <laughs> he's like, what's going on here? And uh, well, we ended up taking him back in and ended up with a broken, a broken hand that day because he had, wow. landed, had landed on my hand. But, you know, if I hadn't had that training to know how to do that to how to efficiently take this kid down and to make sure that he was, you know, okay when we did that, but yet we were safe and secure because he had pulled out a pipe out of his pants and he was brandishing this pipe. And, uh, but fortunately the training kicked in and we took him down and we're able to then take him back to the hospital in a safe way. But, uh, it just reminds me of, you know, what you guys can experience every single day out there on the street. Yeah, you know, uh, another of the segments we did in wrist lock was with a uh, jujitsu practitioner and former uh, trainer at my department uh, named Mike Bland. And, and it's another one of my favorite quotes where he says, you know, you're working a job where in your first shift, you're going to probably put your hands on somebody. You might want to be good at it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It's, it's, it's so true. And yet uh, it, it, it's shocking to me and every other police trainer who you could ask any one of them in this country, and they will tell you how, how shocked we all are that it's such a low priority in terms mm. of uh, ensuring that our cops are trained at the level they need to be. Do you think that with the proper training, you're going to have fewer officers reaching for their weapon if they're trained properly? Well, you know, <clears throat> there is a, uh, a common uh, phrase in police work called threat perception. Mm -hmm. And so it's always going to be different. If I'm six foot three, 205 pounds, my perception of threat when I encounter a suspect is going to be different than, say, a female who's five foot two, 105 pounds. Yep. Right. We we uh, cops come in all shapes and sizes and do this job. And there's a lot of discretion when it comes into how you do the job, as long as you're following policy. Mm -hmm. But when you look at somebody, I might say, well, I feel comfortable being at this distance from this person and interacting with them the way I am. Whereas the next police officer might have a completely different thought process mm -hmm. on that. And that's okay because mm -hmm. it's going to just depend on, on how you feel in that moment. You're the mm -hmm. one that's there. You're the one that has to deal with it. In other words. Right. So, you know, as, as far as when you're going to go for your weapon, that is going to have a lot to do with what type of threat you think is coming your way and what you feel like you need to be prepared for. That is always going to be dictated by one important thing, the suspect's actions. Mm -hmm. Are they doing what you're telling them to do? Or are they putting their hands in their pockets when you're telling them not to? Are they walking away or are they going to where you're telling them to stand? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of factors go into every single interaction. Mm -hmm. And I know talk to my friend Todd Jerry down in Garland. He talks a lot about training officers how to speak, how to how to speak to a potential in, in a threat situation. And sometimes the words that you use can help diffuse or help inflate. A situation and sometimes you or you can escalate a situation by using the wrong the wrong type of vocabulary the wrong you know inflections in your voice if you're trained to to do this properly you may be able to mitigate some of these situations that officers end up in uh there's no question and i think that just comes back to what we were speaking about earlier and that and that's confidence and mm -hmm. what i had said john gentile said in the way of you know being proficient means i'm less likely to use force mm -hmm. i do think that a lot of police officers who are poorly trained tend to jump the gun you know why cuz they're human yeah and they get scared just like the rest of us of don't think that police officers don't have all of the same emotions mm -hmm. so certainly if they perceive a threat and they get scared and their heart starts to race and that cortisol starts to flow you know uh into your brain that is you're going to have a human reaction is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's going to change that is the muscle memory that comes from training frequently. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing in a UFC fight that Forrest Griffin talks about. You know, if you, you, if you want the, 
what if you want certain techniques to come out when another guy's punching you in the face, it's only going to come out if you train that thousands of times. Mm. Otherwise, you, you can't expect to perform under pressure. It's just not possible. Yeah. Well, this is a, this is a great conversation. So where can people see your film? Uh, Rislock is available on all of the uh, transactional platforms and any of the ad based platforms. So you can watch on Amazon, Apple TV, Google Play, Microsoft Store, Hoopla, Voodoo, Plex, Tubi, all, all of the usuals. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll make sure we put the, the link in the show notes so people can access those and, and, and check out this film. And the other thing that uh, I would love to, we, talk, we talked about this offline ahead of time, but I would love to have this film as part of our educational toolkit for the PTSD 911 film. So when agencies purchase the film, they'll also they'll, they'll get two for one. They'll get, they'll get uh, wrist lock as well. So I would like to offer that to you and we can make that happen in the next few weeks. Uh, would love nothing more. I think that it would be a, a great combination. Again, as a longtime police trainer myself, it's always great to have these extra tools to convey that message. And, and, and your film, PTSD 911, which uh, as you know, has my unwavering support. And I, I believe it conveys such an important message uh, when it comes to the mental health arena and, and how officers need to or are currently coping or not coping with many of those issues. Uh, a lot of times it leads to, to tragedy that can be avoided, as we know. Um, and, and yeah, Risk Lock is a great film for police trainers to really have an understanding as to what is necessary to bring cops to the level of proficiency they all need to be at to be successful in use of force encounters. Awesome. So uh, just let everybody know, coming soon to a toolkit near you with ptsd 911 we'll have uh you can get the, the ptsd 911 film all the extra resources that are there and very soon including the, the film risk lock from from jason jason thank you so much for producing this film and thank you for the work you're doing thanks for being a friend and thanks for coming on the show today yes yeah, absolute honor conrad uh you know i love your work and uh, it's always great to talk with you and I wish you a uh, very happy holidays and uh, safe and fun moving to a new state. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So well, safe to you, brother. Thank you. Thanks again, Jason, for being on the show and for the opportunity to partner with you as we put Risk Lock into the digital toolkit. And I want everyone to know that when your agency purchases PTSD 911, you now also get Risk Lock as a part of the Digital Educational Toolkit. So it's a two for one. So be sure to talk with your team and order the film today so you can begin using it in your training immediately. And thanks for listening to the show. I really appreciate it. Please, if you have some time, leave a review and give it five stars if you think it's worth it. And be sure to subscribe to the show. And just a reminder that you can see the video of this content on our YouTube channel. I'll leave a link in the show notes where you can access all of that. And remember, you are not alone. If you need someone to talk to and don't know where you can turn, dial 988 for help. Until next time, be well, take care of yourself and those around you, and go out and do something great in the world.